Uh, hello, everybody. I I'm Jinghua Zhao, Professor of Cities and Transportation at MIT. Today, I'm really glad to have Professor Harry Tuller uh, join us talk about the fuel cell powered vehicles, what's the opportunities and the challenges. Right? At this forum, we've been discussing a lot about electric vehicle from the battery, charging station, public policy, entrepreneurship, business reality. Uh, by far, the lion's share of EV cell are based on these lithium battery powered vehicles. Right. But we have not discussed much about hydrogen powered fuel cell vehicles, which promise at least uh, extended operation ranges, uh, rapid refitting, et cetera. There, there are clearly different pros and cons between the electric vehicle, battery based electric vehicle versus the hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. There's also a very obvious lack of adequate uh, facilities uh, that Hera, we, we were discussing before the session formally starts. The, the meager number of stations in the United States talk about a hundred or so, uh, as well as the clean hydrogen generation, transportation and storage issues. So raising the question whether the hydrogen powered vehicle will for, forever be the technology of the future. So I'm really like, excited to have Professor uh, Tala join us to really report on the recent progress on the stationary re uh, reversible fuel cell uh, electrolysis cell device capable of efficiently store clean but intermittent solar and wind energy in the form of hydrogen, but also the means for extending the life of such devices and the general challenges towards achieving the cost effective and competitiveness of the fuel cell operated EVs. So before I give the uh, pass the forum to uh, Harry, I do want to do a short poll uh, to see what the, the, the level of interest in hydrogen in this audience. So there are three levels. One is you conduct interest, uh, research on hydrogen powered vehicles, or you practice this in the industry or in the association or government policy, infrastructure, et cetera, or you're just, you're just curious about this topic. Now there are 80 or oh, 90 people participated. I'll give a few more seconds. All right, so I'll close the poll and share the result with everyone. Uh, Harry, if you can see the result, about 16% yeah. actually doing research, 11% practice, and the rest are the curious bunch in, as in this audience here, right? Uh, okay, uh, the next one is in the chat, I invite everybody to type in your organization, uh, your location, and the current time. So that again, we get a sense of the who are the audience here, right? the organization, location, and the time. UCL, Denzo, MIT, Berlin, Nice, thank you. Yeah. So let me introduce Professor Harry a little bit. Uh, professor uh, Harry Tala is a professor of material science and engineering at MIT. Uh, he's a world-renowned expert on electroceramics, a class of ceramic material that enable the technologies such as energy conversion, envi environmental sensing, electronics, and communication. Another recent focus is the solid state ionics, which examine the movement of ion or charged uh, atoms in solids such as ceramics. His research group models, processes, and optimize energy-related devices such as sensor, battery, fuel cell, as well as micro-electro-mechanical systems. He has a 33 patent, uh, is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Electroceramics, and also the co-founder of Boston Microsystems, a pioneer in the silicon carbide-based MAM technology and device. Without further ado, let me pass the phone to Professor Harry Tanner. Thanks very much. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay, yes. everybody see it? Good. Well, first yes. of all, uh, I want to uh, thank Professor Zhao for the invitation. Uh, actually, it's quite serendipitous. Uh, we were both on a flight together to Japan, and he noticed I was reading a uh, New York Times Sunday Magazine on electric vehicles. And he said, could I borrow that magazine? And I said, of course, uh, but please return it because I'm interested. 
So we started chatting and uh, he informed me that he was also from MIT and uh, 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 involved in this mobility uh, uh, forum. And uh, immediately when he learned I was interested in fuel cells, he said, can you come speak? So I said, well, you know, I'm, I deal with the movement of ions and atoms. Uh, are you sure you want me to talk to such a broad audience? And he said, of course. Anyway, uh, I, I, uh, I'm happy to be here and uh, kind of give you one man's view of uh, what uh, the opportunities and challenges are with regard to fuel cell power. And as you can see, I mentioned, uh, is this always, is this going to be always uh, uh, a technology of the future? So uh, fuel cell vehicle, obviously uh, we have, are in love with the internal combustion engine because of its uh, speed, of its range, of its convenience. But of course it does a lot of emissions. So actually hydrogen is also another chemical fuel in that regard, uh, if we could actually operate a fuel cell vehicle, most of the advantages that we presently have in terms of, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, long range and convenience and so on could be replicated. Uh, but of course there are challenges, uh, which we'll talk about. Uh, that being, where do you get the green hydrogen from? Uh, we don't wanna use gray hydrogen because then we're just emitting again. So uh, I'm gonna, uh, emphasize the fact that uh, clean energy uh, uh, is at our doorstep. Of course, we have the availability of, uh, of solar and wind, and it's really uh, uh, penetrating the energy source uh, that we have available uh, quite rapidly. However, uh, it suffers from one major problem, and that's intermittency, right? So therefore, in order to really take advantage of that clean electricity, we need some way of storing it. And uh, electrochemical is, of course, a very attractive mode. The one that most people are convenient, uh, uh, familiar with, I should say, is the battery. Uh, but batteries are costly and the need to scale them up to the level required for uh, the energy storage from inter intermittent sources would be quite challenging. But an alternate uh, option is in fact to uh, use that electricity and remember back from high school chemistry, right? If you apply a voltage across a solution, uh, uh, you can generate uh, hydrogen and oxygen bubbles, okay? So this is a direct uh, conversion from electrical to chemical energy. That chemical energy is hydrogen. Uh, if the electricity is generated in a pure sense, so will the hydrogen be. So I think that's really the key. Uh, if in fact uh, we can scale this process up, we have the option on the one hand uh, to generate uh, lots of uh, green hydrogen, uh, which we could then of course use when needed to generate electricity in a reversible uh, electrolysis fuel cell but also we could use that hydrogen for other purposes like refueling a vehicle. Uh, the last part of my presentation will be just a couple of slides on work we're doing in the laboratory. Uh, all of this business about the use of fuel cells and electrolysis cells depends on the ability to make them efficient, uh, cost-effective and long-lived. And uh, I just wanna end the presentation by saying we're, we've made some uh, important progress in uh, achieving some of those objectives and I'll be happy to share those with you. So here's kind of the outline. Uh, of course, we're concerned and suffering from CO2 induced global warming. Very briefly, I'm gonna summarize how we got there with the emphasis on what the implications has been in terms of vehicles and mobility. Uh, we'll be reminded why we're hooked on oil in terms of transportation and why hydrogen fuel vehicles might make sense. And then of course, we wanna distinguish uh, between the, the electric vehicle options, battery versus fuel cell. Uh, battery, how fast can they grow? Well, they're growing very rapidly. We're already there. Uh, fuel cells are still far behind. And the question is why? And of course, largely because we still don't have uh, reliable sources of green energy. And uh, I'm going to 
suggest, and it's not just me, but uh, uh, many experts uh, believe that uh, elect electrolyzers are really the answer, and I'll explain why. And as I mentioned right at the end, I'll talk about some advances we've made in the laboratory. Okay, so I think most of you are familiar with the fact that uh, energy use has been tied uh, to uh, uh, the GDP. So, you know, obviously as we get more sophisticated in our needs in terms of transportation, in terms of uh, the kinds of materials we use, uh, uh, the, the way we manage our factories and so on, is a direct correlation between the energy use uh, and our GDP. And uh, across the world uh, today, there's a uh, a factor of 100 in terms of energy needs between the highest GDP nations and those which are the lowest. But of course, we want to focus on the impact that's had on vehicle consumption and use. So uh, a prime example is uh, looking at what's happened to China over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And uh, as you can, as we very well know, uh, the GDP in China has grown astronomically fast in the last 20 or 25 years. And you can see that uh, under Jemin, where we opened up to the West, uh, there's been a tremendous uh, development in, in technology and uh, manufacturing capabilities. Well, if you look at uh, correspondingly the vehicle sales in China, over the last uh, 15 years, you see likewise a tenfold increase. So we, we've gone from roughly 5 million to 50 million vehicles, right? I'm, I'm sorry, 25 million. I'm, I'm confusing things here. It's a factor of uh, five. The 50 here is the percent change uh, in a, a given year. So the fact of the matter, the combination between the fact that certain countries uh, like China and others which are coming along in Southeast Asia, India, Indonesia, et cetera, uh, the GDP is growing as well as the population growth together has obviously led to this explosive growth in the use of fossil fuels and therefore the CO2 emissions. Okay, so what percentage of that is connected with uh, transportation? You can see uh, in a recent year, 2022 in the US, uh, roughly, uh, 27% of our energy consumption is by vehicles, almost a third. But also keep in mind that if we're thinking about going the electric route, uh, then also we have to be con concerned about where does that power come from uh, directly. And of course, there, uh, again, we're, we're looking at 38%, uh, much of which presently is generated by coal and gas, although of course the coal part is dropping rapidly. And uh, we're depending more and more on renewables, which are intermittent, as I indicated in the beginning. Okay, so how come we have this love affair with uh, these kinds of vehicles? Uh, largely because it's so easy, just fill her up, you know, pull in a couple of minutes, you're on your way. You can go again for three, 400 miles. And why? Because those fossil fuels pack an enormously big punch. They have a very high stored chemical energy. Uh, of course, there's some interest now in some cleaner alternatives like natural gas, but uh, still with pretty much based on energy, uh, on, uh, sorry, on uh, petroleum. So why? We have an enormous installed infrastructure almost 150,000 filling stations. So we have stations, we had uh, almost one on every corner. And of course, uh, that convenience of uh, the low cost, the convenience and so on uh, has resulted in uh, the order of almost 300 million registered vehicles. So worldwide, we're talking about uh, probably several billion vehicles. Right. So really the key is the rapid refueling, the extended range, and of course the uh, affordability. But we know what the challenges are. We're using non-renewable resources. 
Uh, they're strategic, so the price fluctuates considerably depending on whether we have a war or we don't have a war. Uh, we're concerned about contamination and emissions and so on. So all of those combined have put the handwriting on the wall, right? So finally, it's taken a while, but government regulations and incentives have really combined to drive the combustion engine vehicle to extinction. It's a little hard to, to believe because if we look outside today, uh, most of the vehicles are still internal combustion. But I think the, the, the situation has really uh, uh, dramatically changed and we're, we're seeing that uh, uh, following in, this, in terms of, as I'll show you in, in, in the numbers of uh, new vehicles being uh, sold, which are electric. So what would be the simplest way of resolving this question? If we could just replace the conventional refueling stations using gasoline with hydrogen refueling stations, uh, all of these advantages that we talked about before uh, in terms of rapid refueling, extended range convenience would be there because of the high energy density, but we have the only emission would be water, H2O. So if we uh, uh, utilize hydrogen in a electrochemical process, the only product is water. So how many hydrogen fueling stations do we have worldwide? Well, that's the problem, right? Uh, even the largest, which is in China, is 250, not hundreds of thousands, but hundreds. Right, so we're we're talking about uh, a factor of a thousand difference. Japan, one hundred and sixty; South Korea, one hundred and forty; Germany, ninety-three; United States. It's actually lower than I had remembered, only about fifty. But if you're looking at that worldwide, it's maybe a thousand. Right, so uh, that's the problem. How do we uh, break through in terms of uh, making these uh, stations available? So I'll be talking about that. So. Uh, I have to move some stuff here because I can't see my own titles. Here we go. Excuse me one second. Okay, uh, sorry. So is there a future for electric vehicles? The future is here. <clears throat> In 2022, over 10 million electric vehicles were sold worldwide. Um, you can see down here at the bottom, that uh, mainland China, 6 million were sold, roughly 60% of the worldwide. Europe, 26, 2.6 million. And even in the US, we're approaching a million. And in 2023, the uh, predictions are that we will sell over a million vehicles. So it's no longer a drop in the bucket. Uh, of course, there's gonna be fluctuations uh, up and down, but the point is, uh, I think it's kind of an inevitable trend. And uh, in a sense, there's a parallel challenge in terms of uh, recharging stations, but uh, uh, nowhere near the problem that we're facing with potentially with hydrogen refueling stations. So there are you know, literally now hundreds of thousands of recharging stations and they're growing very rapidly. Okay. So what are our electric vehicle options? All right, they're kind of uh, three general ones. Uh, the ones that, that came onto the market first were the hybrid electric vehicles like the uh, Toyota Prius, which really uh, uh, drove that technology uh, uh, already now, I, I don't know, it's 10 or 15 years ago, at least uh, uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, but now, of course, we're, uh, we're moving more towards the uh, fully uh, battery electric vehicle, the, no internal combustion engine on board at all, which would be, for example, exemplified by the Tesla vehicle. And the alternative technologies is one that's based on the fuel cell. And uh, the prime example is the Toyota Mirai, which is also a very attractive vehicle, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Okay, so let's take a look at, therefore, the, the breakdown in electric, electric vehicle sales by type 
and location. And then I want to move something out of here. Out of way. Oh. Yeah. So first of all, let's look at the left uh, side. And this distinguishes between light duty vehicles, let's say passenger vehicles, uh, SUVs, and heavy duty vehicles like uh, uh, trucks. And uh, what you can see is, uh, number one, there's, you can see the rapid increase in the number of sales. So from more like the range of 2 million in 2018-19 to uh, uh, essentially five times that number, as I mentioned, over 10 million vehicles. But what you can see is they're almost uh, completely uh, associated with the lighter duty vehicles, largely passenger vehicles. Right. Heavy duty is just a, a small segment of that. Okay, then we can take a look at the next uh, series of uh, curves, which are what type of electric vehicle is it, right? So uh, BEV is the battery electric vehicle, PHEV is the plug-in hybrid, and uh, the FCEV is the fuel cell. And again, what you can see is they're battery based one way or the other. Uh, definitely the, the battery electric vehicles are, are growing very rapidly, uh, but the fuel cell is just a tiny, tiny uh, sliver on top of that. Okay, so it's now interesting to have a look at uh, how is the energy, trans the, transporta the energy use in the transportation uh, sector utilized. And uh, what you can see is obviously uh, the majority are light trucks and uh, cars and motorcycles. And uh, initially, uh, I, I used this slide uh, some weeks ago, and uh, John Movenzato was in the, in the audience, and I was trying to combine light vehicles with other trucks light trucks with other trucks. He said, no, the light trucks are like SUVs. So they should really be combined with uh, passenger vehicles. So if, if I look at the passenger vehicles and the light trucks, really roughly 50% of that is uh, energy is utilized by uh, you and I, okay? Uh, when we're talking about heavy duty vehicles, and uh, so if I subtract minus aircraft is still significant, 35%. And uh, what I'm going to argue, of course, is that the initial opportunity for the fuel cell is really in the heavy duty vehicles. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to compete uh, initially in passenger vehicles, uh, light trucks, uh, and given that the battery uh, vehicle is so entrained and uh, does the job quite well. Okay, so given the fact that this is where the opportunity lies, uh, let's have a look at uh, what those uh, sale numbers are like. So they're not insignificant. We're talking in the order of uh, 150,000, uh, uh, distinguished between buses and trucks. <clears throat> but nevertheless, if you, if you look at uh, what kind of vehicles they are, what kind of electric vehicles they are, uh, they still are largely battery, right? So even in the area where we we believe there's going to be the opportunity, initially at least, they're mostly uh, battery. And what we're going to look at is to see why we believe the greatest opportunities uh, lie uh, for fuel cell vehicles with the heavy duty vehicles. Let's see why. Okay. So here we have to look at the, the famous uh, Rigoni plot, which is uh, energy density versus power density. And uh, you can see immediately why it's so hard to get off the alcohol wagon, so to speak. So if, uh, obviously the, the sweet spot is the right-hand top corner where we have the highest power density and how, highest energy density. What do I mean by that? Energy density is the amount of energy you store and determines, therefore, how far you can go, how much energy uh, you need to go a certain number of miles. Power density is how rapidly can you utilize that energy. And of course, that's 
predominantly in the sense of uh, how rapidly can you accelerate. So being up here in the right-hand corner means that you have very long ranges uh, combined with uh, rapid acceleration. So uh, uh, that, that's what got me interested in vehicles, uh, high-performance vehicles. So I have a couple of old sports cars in my barn still. But uh, So let's look then at uh, where we stand in terms of the lithium-ion battery. So if you look at the lithium-ion battery, you can see that uh, <clears throat> it doesn't do as good as the combustion engine, but it has uh, a pretty good power density. And actually, it can out-accelerate the combustion engine vehicle largely because electrons move at the speed of light. So as soon as you step on the pedal, those electrons are at the motor and turning those wheels. Where with a combustion engine, right, we have all those gears and, and cranks and uh, uh, to, to transfer that energy. So we have that lag. Uh, so you know now with a lithium ion battery, you can go to zero to 60 in three seconds and you don't have to pay $500,000 for that vehicle, right? Uh, but it is reduced in terms of the energy density and therefore we do have to recharge pretty often. So that's where the fuel cell is attractive. You can see it's up here. So it has about an order of magnitude higher energy density and therefore this is why uh, typically we can uh, travel much longer distances. Uh, and that's, that's where the advantage comes for the, the, the heavy vehicles. So let me just uh, briefly describe the difference between these two kinds of electrochemical devices. So in a high energy density battery, like a lithium ion battery, everything is self-contained. It's in one package. Uh, all the chemical species are there and all you're doing is you're distributing them during the discharge from the anode, you have a high lithium content and you transfer it to the cathode, which initially has very little lithium. So there's this uh, chemical driving force, which uh, has these species wanting to react explosively. And in fact, that's why we're so concerned sometimes about the safety of these batteries, because if we allow the constituents, the chemical constituents to be directly in contact, you will get an explosion, right? There's so much energy there. But uh, in an electrochemical device, we force those species, the lithium, for example, to split up into an ion and take an ionic pathway through the electrolyte and the electron through the external circuit and recombine uh, at the uh, cathode. So, the advantage of all this is all in a single package and it can be readily uh, recycled in a sense of charged and discharged. So all you're doing is moving the chemicals within the package and you don't have to involve the external environment, okay? Now, when you get down to the details, there's a lot of complicated chemistries, which I don't have time to go into. But obviously, uh, one of the issues with the lithium batteries is questions of critical materials. Uh, we need cobalt, which is mined only in the Congo, and lithium is uh, difficult uh, to achieve. And these whole things are difficult to recycle. So there's a you know a lot of questions about what will happen as things scale up. Uh, will we have enough of these materials, and uh, will we be able to recycle them in a, in a reasonable time? But uh, some of the key parameters uh, are similar to that, which we'll talk about in the fuel cell, is the range, uh, which is at this point, not too bad, but requires bigger and bigger batteries. Acceleration is very rapid, as I mentioned. The big challenge is charging times, uh, question about life and safety and critical materials. But of course, there's been tremendous progress and there's continued progress where uh, the charging times are, are being decreased, the ranges are being extended, uh, the lifetime of the devices are being extended and uh, people are working very hard to minimize the, the use of critical materials. So it, it, it's, it's a, uh, something 
in dramatic progress. There's so much interest and money in, invested that you can be assured that there will be continued progress in these areas. Okay, so what about the fuel cell? The main thing to keep in mind is in the fuel cell, it doesn't carry a, along all the chemistries, which is a, is a plus in terms of being able to uh, <clears throat> have a package uh, which is a more uh, condensed, uh, but there are, there are trade-offs. Okay, so what do I mean? All right, here the reactants are hydrogen and oxygen. So obviously the hydrogen is something we have to carry around with us uh, in the car, uh, and that would be the equivalent of gasoline. That's our chemical fuel. And just like in a combustion engine, we don't need the oxidant. We don't need the oxygen from the air uh, to uh, in, enable the explosive reaction to occur, right? So that's a big plus. And likewise, in the fuel cell, uh, oxygen is in the air. So we can utilize that. Uh, the price we pay is that we have to convert gaseous species to ionic and electronic species in a reversible way. So on the left-hand side, the hydrogen, which is a molecule, has to be broken up into a proton and electron here at the anode. And generally speaking, we need catalysts like platinum to uh, encourage that reaction to occur. And on the other side, we need the opposite reaction where the hydrogen has to uh, collect the electrons and react with the oxygen to form the water, right? So both of those reactions uh, are catalytically driven. <clears throat> and uh, that's uh, where some of the challenges lie. <clears throat> but ultimately speaking, we start out with hydrogen and the only product in the end is we have water. So it's a very clean process uh, with the advantages of high energy storage capability. Okay, so what are the advantages? It's a long range, uh, good startup capabilities. And with this kind of fuel cell, which is based on a polymer electrolyte, proton conductor called Napion, uh, the operating temperature is quite low. I think I mentioned it over here, 85 degrees Celsius, right? And that's, uh, that's even lower than the operating temperature of the combustion engine. <clears throat> so therefore it's the process of starting it up. And for, uh, as I'll show you later, the fuel cell vehicle can start up at minus 30 Celsius uh, uh, because its operating temperature is, is quite low. So it's very uh, suitable for portable applications and scalable. Generally speaking, elect electrochemical devices are scalable. So you can have a, a battery or fuel cell that, that puts out uh, nanowatts or puts out megawatts, uh, which is not the case for internal combustion engines. <clears throat> so because it's scalable to large vehicles, much more so than batteries, right? Because the batteries get quite big and heavy because they're carrying along all that, all those, those chemistries with them. And that's where the opportunities are. The disadvantages which are being overcome uh, are the generally costly catalysts and membranes. Um, and there are other issues I, I don't have time to go into, but the, there is some issues with regard to uh, the purity of the reactants in terms of uh, poisoning some of the catalysts, which I'll come back to later. And of course, we need the refueling stations. <clears throat> okay, so very briefly, here's kind of a cross section or the anatomy of the fuel cell vehicle. <clears throat> the key is, of course, the storage. And uh, at this stage, the most practical way of storing it is in a high pressure uh, tank, uh, which uh, is based on uh, carbon reinforced, uh, carbon fiber reinforced plastics and are now quite uh, safe and capable of uh, <clears throat> carrying around enough hydrogen to provide something like 800 kilometers of range. There's the, the fuel cell stack, 
That's where all the reactions occur, as I mentioned earlier. Of course, there everything is driven by electric motors. <clears throat> and but we still need a battery pack, right? So uh, in terms of uh, the fact that the fuel cell uh, prefers to operate in a kind of optimum regime. And I think that's where Gil is probably more expert at, at that than I am. But uh, <clears throat> so it, as an auxiliary role, the battery uh, plays an important role as well, but obviously would be much smaller than in a battery vehicle. So here I am in uh, at QC University. That's where I was heading when I, I met uh, Professor Zhao in the first place. And uh, together with Professor Sasaki, who's uh, uh, very, very, uh, plays a very important role in Japan in terms of uh, hydrogen technology, fuel cell technology. And uh, besides his academic and research uh, activities, he's also uh, important in uh, consulting with the government in terms of uh, uh, energy policy, clean energy policy. So I had the opportunity to drive around in this vehicle. This was January, so it was a little bit of snow there. But here's the, the issue. Only 2,100 Mirais were sold, not solid, sold in 2022 in the US compared to where we mentioned something like close to 800 or 900,000 battery vehicles. Of course, the real attractive features are still the range, the refueling time, the ability to operate over a wide range of conditions. So uh, how do we get around this question of the hydrogen refueling infrastructure? So the vehicle is there. Uh, it has very attractive performance. It has all of these uh, attractive features. Uh, and that's what I like to suggest some options. So. This picture on the left here, I think is probably familiar to many of you. This uh, kind of interfacing between the electric uh, grid infrastructure and the, uh, uh, and, and the sources for generating that electricity, the renewables, wind, uh, solar, nuclear, and others. And uh, <clears throat> the connection then with, with hydrogen, right? So, what I would like to emphasize is really the need to be able to go back and forth readily between the electric field infrastructure and the hydrogen. And that's where the fuel cell, the reversible fuel cell electrolysis cell comes in. So electricity intermittent, we have an excess, we generate hydrogen. That hydrogen is, is green hydrogen. And of course can be used in what I would argue is for transportation, but also for all of these other purposes, right? So there's an enormous amount of hydrogen used in generating ammonia and fertilizers and synthetic fuels. In, and of course there's much promise in terms of clean metals production. Enormous amount of CO2 is generated in uh, the, 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 pre, the creation, the generation, the fabrication of iron and steel and, and other uh, metals. <clears throat> okay, so there's actually quite a significant uh, hydrogen sourcing and distribution channels existing today. But the problem is that 95% of it is generated by these kind of thermochemical routes. And I've just listed a couple here, and this is, uh, uh, steam methane reforming. And that is for every kilogram of hydrogen produced, you're producing a, a eight to 10 kilograms of CO2 or related whole calcification, even worse than that. So the problem is that yes, you're getting hydrogen, but <clears throat> at what cost in, in terms of just tremendous emissions? So only about uh, four or 5% of the hydrogen today is being generated by clean processes by uh, electrochemical processes. And that's really where we have to move. So this is an, indeed the, the recommendations of the of, of IRENA, which is the International Renewable Energy Agency. And uh, 
their suggestions, not only suggestions, but what they're strongly recommending is the fact that uh, we scale up electrolyzers as one important way to achieve the, the climate goals. <clears throat> so the key is uh, in terms of the hydrogen, it has to be green from the out outset. And that's where electrolysis comes in. And once that's available, it becomes key for long haul transport, shipping and aviation, as well as green steel and chemicals. Obviously low cost electricity is essential. Uh, so where this occurs will depend on uh, what parts of the country, what parts of the world we have low cost electricity, but also uh, what they emphasize, there has to be major reductions in the cost of electrolysis plants, as much as 80%. And we'll talk about that some more. And also there, there needs to be some important uh, fundamental breakthroughs. <clears throat> so even if we succeed in terms of creating uh, effective means and, and cost-effective means for generating electricity, uh, generating hydrogen, it still doesn't uh, address the uh, transport challenges. And there are many. For example, hydrogen tends to embrittle steel. Uh, so therefore, if we are going to use uh, steel piping or try to use steel piping, that would be a challenge. Okay. So my argument is we need on-site hydrogen generation. So this brings us to a slightly different uh, fuel cell electrolysis technology. It's one in which I work. It's, they're called high temperature fuel cells. And uh, as Professor Zhao mentioned, I have an interest in ceramics. And these are based on uh, oxide materials. So they're high temperature fuel cells and electrolysis cells. And uh, they're, the beauty of them is multiple fold is because they operate at higher temperature and we use steam instead of water, uh, uh, there's a considerable reduction in the electricity energy needed to uh, convert uh, from uh, the electricity to, the, to, to split the water to generate the hydrogen. Uh, because we operate at higher temperatures, the reaction kinetics are much faster, so we can use uh, non-noble metal catalysts, much cheaper catalysts, and we're less susceptible to poisoning effects. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, we have this reversible operation. <clears throat> uh, and in this picture here, of course, we can use the renewable energy and uh, we can also utilize any industrial waste heat to provide some of the thermal energy to, to get these devices to the operating temperatures, which might be the order of seven or 800 degrees Celsius. Okay, so here's my vision. <clears throat> here's our, our fueling station. SOEC is a solid oxide electrolysis cell. And all we need now is uh, pipes to provide the water and electricity. And if we're talking about a high temperature system, sorry, maybe there's some waste heat running around somewhere. Okay, but here's the point. Since the range of these vehicles, now let's focus on the heavy duty vehicles, are many, many hundreds of kilometers we don't need these refueling stations on every corner, right? So where we have, in fact, uh, availability for renewable electricity, water is no problem, and we might have also the source of heat. Uh, and the idea, the concept of on-site generation uh, becomes, uh, uh, seems to me to become much more attractive. Well, we can discuss that. Uh, Happy to hear your opinions about it as I, uh, after we complete this presentation. Okay, so what are the, the challenges? So uh, what uh, Irina has pointed out <clears throat> is that presently the cost of producing green hydrogen uh, by electrolysis is about $5 per kilogram. And uh, to be competitive, it only needs to come down fivefold. 
But look, I mean, solar cells came down a hundredfold, right? And batteries have come down multiple fold as well. And they suggest uh, where the key uh, parameters are in terms of bringing that down. So part of it is uh, scale up. Right now, uh, the number of devices that are built are still not all that great. The cost of electricity has to come down. But also what I wanna talk about is a material scientist who wants to optimize devices is we want to improve the efficiency of the devices and we want to increase their lifetimes. So uh, all of these things play an important role. And I think uh, are accessible over a reasonable time scale. <clears throat> so to finish, I want to just go back to fundamentals and uh, bore you with a little bit of our research, which should only take a couple of minutes. So uh, as I mentioned to you before, uh, both in terms of the electrolysis and the uh, fuel cell mode, there are these uh, reactions which have to occur uh, between the gas phase and the solid phase. And these reactions often are, are slow, but they speed up much more at higher temperatures and with the right catalysts. And one of those, for example, in the fuel cell would be, let's say the incorporation of oxygen from the gas phase, which is then transported across the electrolyte to react with hydrogen. In doing so, we're, we're, we're generating electricity. So key parameter is this reaction rate, right? So the overall efficiency of these electrochemical devices in general, but also the fuel cells are these electrode reactions, which are susceptible to poisons because the catalytic activity depends very much on having those catalysts pristine and accessible to the uh, various reactants. And of course, low losses in terms of resistance of the ionic species within the electrolyte. But also the lifetime depends on the poisons, sensitivity to poisons, and the cost depends on materials criti criticality. Anyway, uh, the Department of Energy has made some targets. And uh, one of the biggest targets is to reduce the degradation rate from the order of uh, percent per thousand hours to a fifth of a percent and of course extended durability uh, and that's uh, something that we've been very interested in looking at in terms of these solid oxide fuel cells so how do we address that it turns out we made a breakthrough a couple of years ago we showed that by modifying the surface chemistry of these electrodes we could vary that reaction rate up and down by a factor of a million. And we could connect that with the, the chemical acidity basicity to say it another way is whether or not we can uh, induce electron accumulation or depletion, which is critical for this uh, oxygen reduction reaction. Uh, in, le in learning about that, we decided that some of the poisons, we now understood why poisons were poisons, and therefore, could we in fact compensate those poisons by uh, reactivating the surface with uh, the opposite, the basic species? So I don't want to bore you with all the different techniques we've used. We, we looked at a different variety of ways of looking at the reaction rate, uh, at the in, in, impedance or the losses at the electrodes, but most importantly, the, the power output. And I just want to show you here that when we uh, poison the surface of the fuel cell, we built a small fuel cell, you can see that the power output dropped about 35%. And chrome happens to be a common poison in solid oxide fuel cells from the interconnects. And what we showed was by subsequent infiltration with calcium, we could actually recover this uh, uh, performance. It's a really big breakthrough because no one before has been able to show the ability to recover performance after poisoning. So in that regard, uh, I think uh, both in terms of performance and lifetime, uh, we're making progress, people are making progress all, all around. Uh, we, we have this interest in <clears throat> simultaneously providing means for uh, uh, storing energy from these uh, types of uh, intermittent energy sources. And uh, sorry, 
that the immediate shorter term opportunities are definitely uh, with the long range vehicles. And in order to do so, one man's vision is all we need is a uh, pipe water and electricity in with the appropriate solid oxide uh, electrolysis cell technology and uh, away we go. <clears throat> so I just wanna acknowledge that uh, our research was funded by Department of Energy through the National Energy Technology Laboratory and uh, various people who are contributors and some collaborators and uh, happy to ask any questions. Answer Great, any thank questions. You. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Haritala. Uh, we, we have a limited time now, uh, but because the Toyota is actually the leader in these hydrogen-based uh, uh, fuel cell vehicles, and uh, we are really lucky to have uh, uh, Dr. Gil Brad, who is the chief scientist of the Telto Motor Company and also the CEO of the Telto Research Institute in the audience. So we invite Gil to give a few minutes remark. And also we'll end at the session at one formally. But for those who really interest you answer the question, I do want to, uh, Harry, if you have some time, we, we can run a bit longer so we have some chance to, to answer the audience question. That'd be great. Yeah. So Gil, yeah. please. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. And Professor Teller, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, what I thought that I would do, given the limited time, I'm going to type in the chat here a link to uh, a little blog that I write every once in a while that talks about uh, what I call the misguided war of the elements, in this case, between lithium and hydrogen. Uh, and I think that uh, some of you will at least find it entertaining, if not informative. Um, the uh, Just to answer uh, some of the questions that popped up here that I saw, uh, the purpose of the battery in the um, fuel cell vehicle is to even out the load uh, to the fuel cell. So it basically uh, responds to the higher frequency changes in demand and lets the fuel cell respond to lower uh, frequency changes in demand. It also absorbs the uh, regenerative energy when you decelerate the car and stores it for giving back up when you accelerate the car, uh, very much like in a hybrid vehicle uh, or plug-in hybrid vehicle, and of course a BEV also. Um, there was a question I saw that popped back about uh, hydrogen combustion. Uh, that is an additional al alternative we're looking at. We don't know if it's good or bad uh, compared to fuel cells, but uh, yep. at higher loads, uh, the efficiency curves cross between uh, um, fuel cells and combustion engines that are running on, on hydrogen. Uh, both will, of course, need fueling and infrastructure, just like Professor Teller talked about. So from that respect, uh, it doesn't really matter much. Um, the the real key thing on the uh, Ragoni plot, and I was so glad to see that uh, for uh, large trucks, is about recharging time or refueling time. Uh, if you think about uh, a BEV truck, a large truck, it requires uh, tens of megawatts of power uh, in order to have a fast uh, re recharging time compared to what uh, diesel trucks do now. And so it's really a kind of a system design um, issue there. And um, so I hope that that's a little bit uh, help, helpful in terms of answering some of the questions that popped up. Uh, and I would be glad to answer more. Please feel free to send me some, some email if you want to discuss things further. Thank you so much. Oh, wonderful. Thank, thank you, Gil. Uh, this is really great. Yeah, so given the time, I will skip my questions and give the time to, to move on to collect the audience questions so that we can have more responses from both uh, I think Harry and Gil together. Yeah, go on, please. Yeah, thank you, Jinya. Uh, thank you, Professor Tala. Uh, I felt like we could go on for another hour. It's that's so fascinating. So regarding the SOEC, uh, there were a couple of questions in the chat on the purity of the water for on-site hydrogen generation. Uh, you know, what kind of water in terms of salinity? You know, uh, is it hard water, soft water in terms of minerals being mixed in? Would large-scale on-site electrolysis require? Oh, that's an interesting question, and. Uh... I don't know the answer exactly, but I do know that uh, <clears throat> I've seen articles where people use uh, seawater uh, for electrolysis processes. So uh, I don't think it's all that critical. So I, I obviously the in certain areas, uh, the availability of very high purity water might be a consideration. Uh, and uh, like I said, I, I don't know the exact answer, but but from what I can gather, it's not that critical. Uh, there was an, another question on, you know, the operation of the fuel cell. 
you, you know, uh, for an IC engine, we are forewarned not to use it in an enclosed space because of, you know, the emissions and the carbon dioxide poisoning. Uh, in a fuel cell in an enclosed place, is there a danger of, you know, the oxygen levels going so low that, you know, you, one would not be able to breathe? So has there been any, I mean, your, your, your points on that, yeah. So uh, this is Gil here. I don't know, if maybe I can take that one. Um, generally speaking, depending on the use, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really uh, a much worse issue with exhaust uh, in terms of carbon monoxide uh, from a um, combustion engine. And so the numbers are such that, um, you know, I could imagine that becoming an issue, but uh, forklifts, for instance, are used uh, in, in indoors all, all of the time, running on propane uh, as an example. So um, I don't think that in a practical terms is going to be much of an issue for most indoor uses. Uh, so there was another question on the possibility of making renewable hydrogen from sugarcane ethanol or biomass. So it, it's claimed that ethanol can be converted to hydrogen in reformers installed in service stations and would, would be cheaper than that obtained from other sources. So your comments on this one. Uh, whenever, you know, what one involves the the different chemicals in the reforming process, it becomes, you know, multiple step and more complicated. I, I think uh, what's attractive about going directly from water electrolysis is all you need is water and electricity. So I, I, I haven't okay. looked details of these other uh, technologies, sure. so I'm really not in a position to answer that. So, so, so regarding the SOE, uh, the SOEC, uh, you know, it, it uh, as a use case, it seems to be a great, you know, home storage solution. Uh, we are seeing a lot of, you know, Tesla power walls and other home store battery storage solutions go up, but these are size limited because of the flammable potential of a lithium ion battery. Like you mentioned, the reactants are enclosed in the battery itself. Uh, so is the high energy density feature and the possibly improved safety of an SOEC, make it more scalable in building so storage applications, you know, just store the solar that you're getting during the day within this and use it in in, in at, at night. So is that what you think a, is, a, is a possible application in the future? Yeah, so that definitely is the case. So we have uh, the much higher energy density associated with the, the hydrogen fuel. And uh, that's what makes it uh, particularly attractive in those regards. And also the... Uh, in terms of this, the scale up for more energy storage, the battery itself has to grow uh, correspondingly, right? With the fuel cell, uh, it's an aerial thing, right? So it's a larger area, but uh, volumetrically, uh, it doesn't have to scale in the same way that the, the battery, which is three-dimensional. So in, in terms of the scaling process, I think the fuel cells is a much more attractive approach. Makes sense. Uh, and do you all have any uh, numbers on the efficiency of, you know, getting the energy from solar, push, putting it into the fuels and then feeding it back into the system compared to just simple battery storage system? Yeah. So, I mean, of, of course, the solar cell conversion efficiency itself is limited, right? Yeah. It's typically order of 20 or 25%. That being said, uh, we still, once we generate that electricity, we need some way of storing it. Now, the important question is what's kind of the round trip efficiency of electrolyzing water and then bringing it back in terms of electricity. And uh, those numbers have been going up considerably and I've seen numbers now as high as 85% round trip efficiency. Now. Consider that's much lower than in the battery, right? In the battery, it's nearly 100%. Uh, but from the standpoint of uh, <clears throat> being able to store that energy uh, in a highly effective manner, uh, the 85% is, is an attractive number. <clears throat> Uh, so there was one question on, you mentioned, uh, you know, LDVs seem to be going the battery electric way. So uh, high uh, heavy duty vehicles uh, are a good target market for uh, hydrogen refueling. Uh, is there, and, and Gil, feel free to chime in as well. So is there a difference in, you know, the, the PSI 
of you know the pipe which is used for refilling between you know light duty vehicles heavy duty vehicles and uh, could you also uh, we understand that hydrogen is stored under pressure so you know the intricacies of the tank storage tank for such vehicles and how complex and expensive in case of a collision what are the safety uh, inbuilt safety features well let me yeah. let me quickly address the uh, vehicle part uh, and then uh if Professor Teller could talk a little bit more about the, you know, size of the hoses and stuff. Um, the uh, tanks are, um, they've been through all of the testings for crashes and uh, so so forth. So, um, you know, they are extremely safe. Uh, and in many cases, uh, I believe safer than uh, batteries in uh, similar uh, crash um, situations. Uh, the way that we presently solve the issue for uh, tanks in the Class A trucks that we have prototyped is we just use more of them. Uh, the ones that we use are a little bit bigger than the ones that we use in the uh, car. There's actually a, a very neat set of work that it turns out that long, skinny tanks are actually, despite what you might think, uh, more efficient uh, because of uh, the sort of thin wall uh, assumption that is made. Uh, than sort of the more conventional uh, shaped tanks that you might think of. And so uh, we've actually been looking at uh, different types of uh, topologies where the geometry, the sort of uh, aspect ratio of the tanks is different and we fold them up uh, in a certain way. So lots of sort of neat things to discuss there perhaps some other time, but uh, the tanks really aren't an issue with the vehicle itself. And again, with class eight trucks, uh, the real key thing is a systems question for what the refueling time uh, can be like to be competitive with the way the trucks tend to be used of that size. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. Okay. Uh, so uh, I just want to move focus a bit to the aviation industry. Airbus and all seem to be doing some pilots in using hydrogen for aviation. Uh, using fuel cells, you know, is direct combustion something that the aviation industry is also looking at? Just your thoughts on, you know, we've talked about surface transportation, we've talked about buildings. I just wanted to just touch upon aviation as well and get your thoughts on it. Yeah, so remember that uh, combustion in general is much less energy efficient than electrochemical processes because it's limited by what we call the Carnot efficiency. So overall, the, the uh, the amount of energy that you can extract from the hydrogen is, is definitely higher by an electrochemical process than by combustion. Uh, I know that uh, BMW worked on uh, looking at uh, hydrogen as like in combustion engines for a while, but I think they dropped that. Uh, I think for the for the reasons uh, I just mentioned. So in terms of aircraft, uh, I think the same thing would be true. That ultimately, what's going to be key is you know how much fuel can you carry, uh, and what's the range you can achieve. And I think ultimately uh, you can do better with the, with the fuel cell. Yeah, and I think the last question probably to end on is uh, how long do you think it'll take to bring a building application of the fuel cell technology to the market? You know, the storage solution that we spoke about. You know, any 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 guesses? That's a good question. So I've been encouraged by the fact that now uh, some large companies <clears throat> have committed to scaling up. Uh, uh, so in the past, it was more, you know, R&D and uh, I'll do this work if I'm supported by government agencies like Department of Energy or the equivalent in Europe or Japan or China. And now what I'm seeing is the commercial entities themselves are making the big investments and are advertising scaled up systems so I uh, and they're talking about in the next couple of years so I think over the next five or ten years we're going to see some uh, uh, big growth in this area and uh, I'm, I'm encouraged hmm. in that. great yeah uh, on the on the point on that point of the infrastructure uh, and also how to scale the whole system part right yeah so Gil, do, do, do you have some thought on to add that what's your position either also the comparison between Japan versus the US or the different contacts here? So uh, we have um, efforts both in Japan and in the US and actually in Europe as well. There's a large fleet of uh, fuel cell taxis that are operating in uh, Paris now, uh, actually. 
Um, it's really about infrastructure, uh, just as with real estate, you know, the catchphrase is location, location, location. Uh, with with hydrogen, it's infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. And uh, I can't say it uh, enough, even saying it three times. Uh, and so the what's so wonderful is that the uh, you know U.S. administration has really gotten behind this with the hubs that they've set up, and we have a lot of uh, hope and confidence that um, that this is going to really change the game here, starting with uh, class eight trucks, and then we'll see where things go from there. The other reason we're so confident, which uh, Professor Tuller talked about as well, is that there are many other uses of, of hydrogen, and the amount of hydrogen that's being produced in the US is just incredibly high. And it's uh, mostly, as he showed, for the petrochemical business, uh, we have to make that production more green. We don't have a choice. Once you do that, it then becomes much more practical for transportation also. Right. The multi-use potential there, that's the great point. Yeah. So I, it's 110 now. So everyone, please join me. Thank Professor Harry Tala for the presentation and also for Dr. Jill Pratt to the, the comments and the conversation.